Okay, Bill. Uh, theory of constraints, constraints management, uh, thinking processes. Um, what do you think about uh, using the term theory of? Well, I understand how it originated because Goldratt was a scientist, a physicist by training, uh, and he was he thoroughly understood the true meaning of the word theory. Uh, a theory is an overarching principle, if you will, that encloses and gathers together connected, interrelated facts or data points and tries to make inductive sense of them. In other words, to be able to explain why things happen and to predict why things might happen in the future. And to that extent, a theory is a very a real and living thing. Uh, the problem is that most people who hear the word theory think it's some blue sky idea that has no grounding in reality. And uh, their re typical reaction is, don't bother me with theory, I live in the real world as if theory is something that's not in the real world, it's in the imaginary world or in the mind, when really nothing could be further from the truth. And even uh, somebody like W. Edwards Deming himself said that action that is not based on sound theory is uh, tampering with a system, it's, it's non-productive. So the fact that Goldratt chose the name theory uh, uh, in using theory of constraints, uh, it's completely accurate as to yeah. what it is because it does wrap around uh, a number of data points and tools and processes and things that are very much related to the concept of constraints. Ties them all together and it makes for a really nice collection of, uh, of data or knowledge that is, can be usefully applied by people. Mm, clearly but, because, but uh, all right, well, uh, no later than, than this week, uh, I was talking with a, a top manager who's got a big problem in his, uh, in his factory, uh, losing lots of money, very critical situation. Uh, but uh, his initial reaction was, I don't want to meet you, I don't want to talk theory right now, I have a real problem to solve. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, so, and that basically <laughs> put the phone down saying, you know, I, I don't yeah. need a theory, I want a solution sort of thing. Yeah. And that was the end of, uh, of, of, of that. I can understand how that happens, I don't understand, and I, to some extent I can understand why, because the people who say that just really don't understand what theory is and they don't realize that where they are and what they enjoy in life today is the result of successful orderly application of sound theory, as Deming would talk about. But, uh, but what is uh, unfortunate though it, because of that is that if you are trying to promote interest in something like the theory of constraints, People look at it and the first thing they do is have a negative reaction because of the word theory. Uh, for that reason alone, I myself stopped using and referring to theory of constraints or TOC in 2002. And from that point on, I referred to it as constraint management. Everybody likes management, okay? And constraint management, if you put it, out there with a lowercase c and a lowercase m looks like a generic term that describes a practice of some sort. And uh, when really the management of constraints, I hate to break it to them, it's a subset of a theory. <laughs> so, but that's what they're interested in, so that's the way I talk to them. If you want the audience to listen to you, you have to go out of your way not to do something that's going to make them stick their fingers in their ears. But having having said that, um, I think people uh, pay too much attention to, 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 to the name problem in, in the theory of constraints world because mm -hmm. if you look at the, the, the other options, uh, you've got uh, especially uh, Lean and Six Sigma and mm -hmm. those aren't exactly ideal marketing labels either. Uh, so, no, uh, you know. no, but if you, if you stop and think about it, yeah. 
uh, and what it is that they propound to offer, um, they should properly be called the theory of lean and the theory of Six Sigma. Absolutely. Because Six Sigma is a concept. Mm -hmm. Well, that's basically what a theory is. It's a concept. Mm -hmm. And lean is a concept. So they should do that, but somewhere along the line, somebody was smart enough, not I say smart meaning smart enough in the marketing and sales domain uh, or the persuasion domain, PR, whatever you want to call it, to realize that uh, theory was not a good thing to be talking about. Okay. Um, the, the other point I wanted to discuss with you uh, was, is our, our thinking processes part of the theory of constraints? Let me explain. Uh, the theory of constraints, if we explained, is it something focused around constraints and leverage points, uh, acting on the constraint uh, will uh, give the, the, the system result, or also referred to as 1%, 99%. Uh, that's one, one area of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there are the thinking processes, and the thinking processes, as far as I'm concerned, don't seem to have m much of constraints or theory constraints or constraints management left in them mm -hmm. uh, and I'm tempted to say that in fact they are both Goldratisms in the sense that Eddie Goldrat was the, the founding father who, who imagined all this mm -hmm. uh, but they are a rather separate beasts and uh, I want to come back to my question are thinking processes part of the theory of constraints? I think that they could be considered a tool of the thinking uh, of the theory of constraints uh, however, when I teach my thinking process courses and when I talk to people about the, th the thinking process, I usually say that there is no direct connection with, uh, between the theory of constraints and the thinking processes mm -hmm. other than the fact that we're both invented by the same man. That said, however, you have to know a little of the history of why he developed the thinking processes. Mm -hmm. He started out uh, selling you know, the software to the world that was based on the drum buffer rope concept and the idea of bottlenecks, uh, controlling bottlenecks in manufacturing processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he found at some point uh, that uh, the companies that were buying his software uh, were not getting the whole system impact that they thought mm -hmm. they should. They weren't realizing quite as much uh, revenue increase or th throughput profit. And, uh, and so they, uh, they challenged him, they, your software isn't working. Well, he started looking at it and he came to the realization the reason it isn't working for them is because their system constraint is not in the production process. So yes, you can get very effective and efficient production out of TOC or out of drum buffer rope, which is a subset of TOC. But if your system constraint lies outside, say in the marketplace or in uh, research and development and engineering, uh, you're not going to see any whole system improvement in terms of the corporate bottom line. So he had to, he had to take a look at what he could do to identify and manage a constraint that isn't located in the production process. Can I just comment on that because um, I think it's not exactly the, the area where it's not in the production process, it is when it concerns management and uh, rules and mm -hmm. policies because, uh, and, and I, I've, I, I meet this problem frequently, indeed if you start uh, initially with a, uh, in a case where the, the, there is a, a bottleneck in production or whatever, mm -hmm. using the theory of constraints very quickly you can increase by 30 or 40 percent the, the, mm -hmm. the throughput uh, uh, of, the, of the factory and uh, you will find that the constraint has moved into uh, sales or marketing and, and, and new product development. Mm -hmm. But in uh, new product development for instance it's not yet uh, the, the, the main domain for thinking processes, there are more operational tools such as critical chain and stuff to help mm -hmm. speed those things up. Um, but the, the thinking processes, it seems to me, are especially pertinent uh, to uh, the top level view and what's mm -hmm. happening with regards to, to, to management. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, do they know where their, their constraints are? Do they know where they're going? Do they know what they have to change to get there? Mm -hmm. I, w I would certainly agree with that. Uh, and the, the, I think the thing to, uh, to, to do is to start from rather the broader perspective and work down to the finer. The broader perspective is, is the constraint internal to the manufacturing process or is it somewhere else? And if it's somewhere else, the tools that you use to optimize the manufacturing process according to the theory of constraints are not going to be much help to you. So what do you do when they are elsewhere? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to find out where they are. Mm -hmm. And and if you, if you don't have any of the other constraint management tools that will do that for you, then you have to have a, a way of determining where the constraint lies. This is where he started to, uh, Goldratt started to depend on a, uh, a methodology that he referred to, I think as early as 1986, as effect, cause, effect, where he looked at the causality of constraint behavior, meaning where is it outside, it's, it's, the, the system is constrained outside the production process. And he looked at that causality as a single linear chain. Mm -hmm. And every time he would go down to a cause of an observed effect, he would try to verify it with another observed effect that would be present if that were in fact mm -hmm. the same cause. In other words, it was a, the second part of the effect was the verification that you're on the right track. Yeah. So he, he did this for four or five years but uh, along around 1990, 91, they started to realize that uh, causality uh, wasn't necessarily singular and linear. It sometimes branched, and it had uh, it had contributing causes as well as primary causes. So, as time went on, he uh, he he formulated in his mind a method wherein he could find wherever the constraint lay, he could find it using this thing that he developed called the logical thinking process. But it required looking at the company as a whole system and not just that part of the system that was the production process. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, everything that you said is absolutely correct, especially the issue of policies and policy constraints. Because in the final analysis, whenever you get a, uh, even if it's in the production process, whenever you get a system constraint, no matter where it is in your system, it's always rooted in the policies mm -hmm. that you employ to do business. And, and the way I describe a policy, it's not necessarily a written procedure mm -hmm. or a regulation, although it could be those. In most cases, you could define it very simply as a policy is the way we choose to do business. Hmm. It is the uh, practices uh, that we choose to employ in order to make the business work. And these practices can either do what we want them to do or they may end up doing what we don't want them to do. And sometimes the practice that we think is needed for, for business today uh, turns out to be obsolescent by tomorrow. The same practice isn't going to work. But you're, if you're not aware of it, you don't know why things are deteriorating. So the thinking process allows you to find out what the cause is of the deterioration. And in almost all cases, it turns out to be some sort of a decision that we made, a policy that has on how we will do business or not do business that leaves us, uh, that, that leaves us with this so-called undesirable effect, which is normally the business isn't making enough money. I'll give you a, a specific example that I used to teach in my courses at the University of Southern California. There was a company <coughs> that was interested in R&D and manufacturing, and that's, that was their business. And uh, their board of directors decided uh, that they would establish a, a policy for the acceptance of new proposed development projects. And that policy was that the, the new project had to show in the business case that it would deliver a 30% uh, 
internal return on investment within three years. If it didn't meet that threshold, they would not accept it. So one day along comes an engineer with this particular idea that he had. It was a brilliant, actually new technology of some sort. And he presented it to the, uh, to the senior management and the board. And it only delivered 22% in three years. And they said, not doing it. And he was disillusioned uh, and he left the company. I don't know where he went from there. But the same technology was invented or developed by a competitor who was not locked around that principle of, uh, or that internal rate of return of 30% in three years. And what they saw was, even if it only gave us 10% in three years, this is a brand new technology, and in four to five years, it's going to give us 50 to 60%, which it did. And it actually, they actually put that first company out of business because the competitor saw the opportunity and did not apply this arbitrary policy on what they would choose to do and not do. And you know, policies can get you good places if they're good policies, but they can also kill you if they're not. So you end up with this, uh, this tool that is really useful to find a policy constraint. But here's the interesting thing. The tool is completely transparent to the concept of constraints. Mm -hmm. It is pure cause and effect. You don't need to be even analyzing a system uh, to determine what the constraint is. You can be using the same methodology, this thinking press process cause and effect methodology, to analyze a historical event. I use two examples in, uh, in my training, and one of them is a logic tree that explains how ill-advised tax policy in the year 100 BC resulted over the course of 30 years in the fall of the Roman Republic and the rise of Julius Caesar in the empire. <laughs> Bad tax policy was the reason for it. So, you know, it, and, it, and when you read the tree, it seems totally logical when you see it. So. I tell my, uh, my thinking process course participants that the only thing that is truly common between theory of constraints and the thinking process is that they were invented by the same guy. And if your goal is to try to manage constraints effectively, the thinking process can be an invaluable tool. Mm -hmm. It absolutely can because it'll take you to constraints very quickly that are outside the normal domain of the other uh, process tools. However, you don't need to know anything about the theory of constraints mm -hmm. in order to learn this process and analyze systems and come up with good solutions. So that's the way I say, that's the reason why I say that the, uh, the method is completely transparent to constraint theory. But if you are a practitioner of constraint theory and you know the thinking process, you're even more powerful. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I, I know what you mean because um, in, in Western Europe where I work, uh, more and more often uh, manufacturing companies have uh, reduced uh, load on the factories and therefore there are no longer mm -hmm. any capacity bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm regularly solicited to help these factories improve their due date performance. Mm -hmm. And obviously uh, in, in those cases it's not a capacity constraint that mm -hmm. is preventing them uh, having providing a good service. Sure. Uh, it's just the, the, the rules and regulations mm -hmm. and uh, identifying all those and explaining why that decision plus that decision makes uh, leads to that effect. Certainly, uh, certainly. Uh, is, is important because mm -hmm. uh, it, it's strange but very often in fact uh, when although they, they say they want to do, uh, they want to deliver everything on time and quickly, uh, you look at the rules and that they've imposed on themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, that's just not uh, those are just not the right rules. That's true, absolutely uh, true. So the the, the the logical explanation, uh, putting it all out, and and, and uh, uh, presenting the the links between the decisions and the, the policies here and there, and the, the result uh, enables them to think, oh, okay, uh, if we want to get there, we have to stop doing this and that, and we have to mm -hmm. do things differently. So. Mm -hmm. I would also go so far as to say that the converse is true. Uh, if you know the thinking process very well and you're good at applying it to solve complex problems, 
a good knowledge of the theory of constraints can make your application of the thinking process even more powerful mm -hmm. than it would be otherwise because it will lead you to better solutions than you would otherwise get. So that's, that's where I am on that. And I think that uh, the thinking process is not the same as constraint management. And the funny part of it is I've heard the same thing said about critical chain. People who learn critical chain uh, without ever having a background in TOC, then they uh, find out that it's a tool of TOC. They tend to think that critical chain equals theory of constraints, and it's not. I even went to one place that, uh, that I saw that said that the software that they used to execute critical chain with, with was uh, theory of constraints. And I tried to, tried to explain the difference to them and they didn't quite get it. But that's, I, I think that's a, a really good point to bring up. Uh, TOC does not equal thinking process. And uh, the thinking process, while it was originally developed to support TOC, can be used completely independently of it, unlike critical chain and drum buffer rope. Okay. Thank you, Bill. So thank you. Thank you.